That's a very engaging talk from Gao. And then let's welcome uh, Drew Kupta. And his, his topic will be JXR structuring text into table. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I'll be presenting JXR, our system that can generate structured tables from unstructured text. I'm Drew Kupta, and this is joint work with my supervisor, Klaus Beveridge, and we're both at the Max Planck Institute for Informatics in Germany. So this is a high-level overview of what I'll be talking in the next 25 minutes. First, I'd like to motivate why do we need to generate tables from text in the first place. Then I'll give a high-level overview of what JIGSA actually looks like and the contributions that we make in our work. And then I'll delve deeper into the details of our system. First, I'll describe the query language that helps describe the schema of the table to be generated from the text documents. Then I'll describe how we actually process this verbose and complex query to retrieve sentences in support of the schema described um, to generate the initial raw table. Then I'll describe the link and analysis operators that help us put together a high quality table that is to be presented to the user. And then I'll present the evaluation setup and the experimental results obtained that prove Jigsaw can actually generate high quality tables. And I'll end with a summary of the key contributions that we make in our work. So let's begin with the motivation. So increasingly what we see nowadays in commercial search engines is the presence of structured knowledge already present in the search result page. So for instance, if the user types in a query such as mystery movies, we get this extracted list of entities displayed in this flywheel representation, which can give you a gist of all the movies um, that come under this category. These are probably extracted from IMDb or Wikipedia. Right? If the user asks the for questions such as who is the CEO of uh, Google, we get this nice little info box or knowledge panel that displays the direct answer from the chat. And if the question is about what are the acquisitions of Google made over the years, we get lists extracted from the documents and displayed right in the search result page. Right? So users are no longer um, uh, expecting to read the documents to find their information. Needed. They want the direct answer displayed in front of them. And tables nicely sort of um, uh, subsume all these kind of uh, structured knowledge. Right? They give you a structured summary that is extracted from multiple documents. They give you a gist of what all the many answers that lie behind the question. And if the user is interested in one particular row or one particular event or fact, they can go back and read the document that helps generate that row in the table. Moreover, if we have this capability of generating tables from unstructured text, we can answer more complex questions. Right? For instance, if we can generate the table of all the Google acquisitions with the date of acquisition and their monetary value, we can ask complicated questions such as, what were the Google acquisitions that were acquired in the year 2006? Or what were the Google acquisitions that costed more than a billion dollars? In a way, we can enable complex analytics over massive amounts of text documents, right? So we can generate um, pie charts, analytical visualizations, graphical plots, and timeline summaries from the table that is generated from the text documents. So next, I'll give you a high-level overview of what Jigsaw looks like. So the key ingredient that goes into our system is um, semantic annotations. So natural language processing tools cannot pre-process large amounts of text to deliver high quality annotations in the form of part of speech. For instance, we can get annotations in the form of noun phrases. In this example, we have California, right? Words, which describe the predicates, right? For instance, acquisition. We get named entities, such as Google and Android. We get temporal expressions, such as 2000s. We also get mentions of money, or numerical expressions, such as here, $50 billion. Right? So these semantic annotations impose a lexical syntactic structure that allows us to perform structured search over large amounts of annotated document collections. The key contributions in our work is first, that the user is able to define the schema of the table to be generated from the text documents. So in this example, basically, what the query stipulates is, um, give me a table that contains all the Google acquisitions, which company they acquired, on what date, and what was the monetary value they were acquired for. We then utilize our indexing infrastructure, Gyanu, that is able to perform structured search over millions of documents within milliseconds to retrieve sentences in support of this complex query to put together an initial raw table. And then we have operators that can then uh, piece together the partial, redundant, and paraphrases pieces of uh, text regions or sentences into an initial uh, raw table and also um, try to estimate the values for those cells where we could not retrieve or spot an evidence, right? So we can estimate the null values using the local context as well as perform global null resolution. 
technique to generate high quality tables. So next I'll talk about our query language, right? How do we actually define the schema to be generated from the text documents? So the very first important operator that we have in our query language is the binding operator, right? So the binding operator specifies the word sequences or the annotations that are to be matched in the text document or to be retrieved. Right? So in this example, the binding operator specified with the band or the exclamation mark first specifies in the disjunctive norm of, uh, disjunctive, as a disjunctive query all the surface forms of Google, right? So Google or search giant, and then following the mention of the company, you have the paraphrases for the predicate, uh, paraphrases for acquisition. Right? So uh, find the bindings for bought or acquired, and following this sequence, find a mention of an annotation, which can either be organization, location, or money. It's important to note that this is in a sequence, right? So this specifies the template or the structure that needs to be spotted in the text documents. So in this example, you see in the three documents, first, like in the first document, you have search, giant, mark, color-coded, then the predicate, and then mention of a company, and then the location. And then the value is then filled into the, uh, for the attributes, for the corresponding attributes. Right? Sorry. Okay, so with the bindings operator, the band operator, the, uh, the mention has to be mandatory present in the document collection to be retrieved. However, the user might not know that if it's present in the document collection or not. So we can relax the match using the question uh, bindings operator. And here, if the value or the word sequence or the annotation is not present, then the cell value is filled with a null value. Right. So in this example, the monetary value is marked with a question mark, and in the first two documents, there's no mention of a monetary expression, so the corresponding cell value is filled with a null. While in the third document, there's a mention of a monetary expression, and then that value is filled with $3 billion. $3 billion. So as I explained, with the bindings operator, it's quite important that um, the mentions of the word sequences and annotations are present in a sequence. So this helps us specify relations for asymmetric um, or asymmetric relationships. For instance, Google acquired a company. This is asymmetric, right? What if we want to generate tables for relations where it, this could be uh, symmetric in nature? For instance, marriage. A person married another person. So the order here is not important, right? And to specify this kind of behavior, we have the unordered marker to decorate the binance operator. And in this example, we have the unordered markers around time and location annotations. So their mentions can be um, uh, interchangeable in, in, the, in the sentence or the text region to be matched. So in the, fir in the first and the last document, you see the location, uh, the time being mentioned before the location, and in the second uh, document, it's vice versa. And finally, we have the stack operator that allows us to stack on semantics on the word sequences. Right? So we want to retrieve, say, sentences that have Google as an organization or a company. right? Google can also be mentioned as a verb to Google for a term or a word, right? So by specifying this, we increase the precision and we increase, uh, we retrieve the right sentences in support for the, for the, for the query. So now I have described the query language that helps us specify the schema of the table to be generated from the text documents. Next, I'll explain how we actually do the query processing and retrieve the sentences in support of such a complex query. So in order to do this, first I'd like to explain how we actually model the documents, the annotated documents in a collection. So consider a really large document collection where each document is pre-processed with annotations and they are present as different layers. Right? So first we have the word layer that essentially consists of the words with their positional information. On top of this we have the part of speech layer that contains for each word part of speech such as noun phrases or cardinal values or verbs. And then on top of this we have the named entity layer. The named entity here essentially, the named entity recognizer essentially takes the noun phrases and then tries to, noun phrases and cardinal values and tries to classify them into classes such as person, organization, location, money, time, date, percentages, etc. And on top of this we have the time layer that contains resolved values for the named entities of type date and time as crisp time intervals. And finally, we have the number layer that contains resolved values for numerical expressions such as money, percentages, etc. So, with this model, this data model for uh, with the layer uh, annotation layers, each element in a layer is modeled with the positional span that the annotation uh, marks in the word sequence. So, for instance, in this example here, the named entity recognizer tags the word sequence a billion dollars. 
right? And the positional uh, span that it tags is 9 to 11. And then we have the element from the annotation alphabet, which is money here, that accompanies the indexing element or the element in the annotation layer. And with this representation of an element in an annotation layer, words are just a speci special case. So here, the words are modeled as a unit length positional span. So in this example, 11 to 11. And the element here is the word from the entire vocabulary of the document collection, which is dollars. So with this model for annotated document collection, we create a suite of indexes. So first, we index the word here using n-grounds and skip grounds. We then index each of the elements in the annotation layers. And then we speed up the query processing where an annotation follows a word sequence. We create combinations of word sequences and annotations using two switches and two fragments. These are essentially aligned and shifted combinations of word sequences and annotations. And then finally, we have a direct index that stores all the annotation layers and the word layer and the word layer with the sentence boundary information. Right? Now we have an indexing infrastructure using which we can then try to match the individual components of the complex query. Right? So in this example, again, we have the query that expresses how to generate the table of acquisitions done by Google. So we have the surface forms for Google. This can be matched using the uh, inverted indexes over the words. Right? So Google is matched, then the predicate to over, right? And then following the sequence, the annotations for organization, time, and money. So this way we have the positional span that corresponds to this complex query. And then we can look into the direct index and fill in the cell values for the bindings. And this is how the first row in the table is derived, right? In a similar way, we'll get other evidences, other sentences that mention the same information. This might be paraphrased, some information might be missing, and this is how we get the other rows in the table. So now we have a way of putting together an initial raw table, right? Now what we want to do is try to eliminate the duplicates. We want to link together the near duplicate rows that mention the same information. And to do this, what we try to do is compute the attribute by similarity between rows, and if the similarity is greater than a threshold, then the rows are deemed, deemed as near duplicates. And to compute the similarity, we try to model the semantics for text and numbers. So to compute the similarity between two cell values that contain a new identity or a, or a word sequence of phrases, we compute the text similarity in three ways. First, we look at the surface level similarity, which is essentially the edit distance between the two word sequences. right? And then we look at the contextual similarity. So we look at how similar the context is that help derive the row in the table. Right? And to do this, we essentially compute the Jacquard coefficient between the bag of words derived from the text match text region or the sentence that help derive the word. And finally, we compute the global similarity. So this essentially is how frequently the word pairs from the different phrases co-occur in the entire document collection. And to compute this, we utilize skip ground dictionaries that contain the statistics over the entire document collection. To compute the final similarity, we simply take an average of these three uh, different similarities. Next, we model the semantics for numbers. Now, numerical values and temporal expressions can be inherently very vague or uncertain in nature. So monetary values, for instance, can be expressed as over a billion dollars or around a billion dollars, right? And temporal expressions can also be highly uncertain, right? A temporal expression can be mentioned such as in the 2000s. So here, we don't know what the interval it's referring to. Either it can be 2001 to 2009, 2003 to 2006. So to capture this vagueness and uncertainty, we model each numerical and temporal expression as, a, as an interval. And to compute the similarity, we look at the Chicard coefficient between these two intervals. So now we have a way of linking together these raw rows, right, and to eliminate the duplicates. One thing we still haven't done is to estimate the null values. And the first way we can estimate them is to actually use the local context um, from the match text region that helped drive the row. And this can be done in three ways. So the first way we use is a simple scoping method, right? So for if a null value exists for a new identity or a part of speech, we can estimate this by looking at the most frequent part of speech or new identity that occurs in the document containing the sentence or the text region, right? If this was a numerical value or a temporal expression, we can com compute a scope by taking the minimum and maximum uh, numerical uh, date or time present in the document to make an estimate. The second way we can estimate the null value is using proximity method. And this is somewhat similar to core reference resolution. So in this example, consider the shaded region as the matched text region that helped derive the row. And if the null value was for a numerical expression 
of our monetary value, we can look at the position at number two to take that as an estimate for this null value. Right. And finally, what we can utilize to make an estimate for null values is compute the frequency in these semantic models for text and time, uh, text and num uh, numbers. So now we have a way of uh, estimating the null values and linking together the near to decay rules. Now I present the analysis operators that help generate the high quality table by computing the representative rows from the set of linked rows, score them, and rank them. So the flat operator essentially takes a set of linked rows and computes a representative row um, to be put in the final table that is to be presented to the user. And to do this, we basically put, look at the most representative cell value for each attribute from the set of linked rows that should be used uh, in the final table. So in this example, as you see here, in the raw table, the three rows convey the same event, which is the acquisition of YouTube in 2006 for $1.5 billion. So to compute the representative row, first we look at the organization, and here we see that YouTube is quite frequent. We take that as the representative cell value in the final table. And then for the attribute value for time, we see that 2006 overlaps with the interval representation for 2000s, and we see that that is a much more narrow and precise notion of time, and we use that as a representative value. And similarly for money, we see that $1.5 billion overlaps with greater than a billion dollars, and is much more precise, and we take that as a representative cell value. So now we have the representative rows present in the final table. Now we look at how we can actually score them. And to compute the score, we look at two aspects. The first is the support um, that the row has in the final table and its novelty amongst the other rows in the table. And the support here is essentially the number of raw rows that, have, that were linked together to produce this representative row upon the total number of raw rows in the initial table. And to compute the diversity or to maximize this, we try to maximize the dissimilarity of a row to the other rows above it in the final table. So we don't end up with rows that talk about a similar entity at the top in the final table. And finally, we have the rank operator. So here we have two ways of ranking the rows in the final table. In the first way, we can actually disregard everything and look at the quality of the sentences or match text regions that help derive the, the, the row in the final table. Right? And to do this, we look at the average inverse, uh, inverse length of the match text region or the sentence um, to rank the rows, and this is based on the intuition that a sh shorter sentence or a shorter match text region is much more concise and presents uh, a much more direct answer than a longer sentence or a longer match text region. The other way we can rank the rows is simply utilize the scores that were generated by the score operator to rank them in the final table. So now our system can take a corpus of documents, we can specify the schema, and we generate the table. Now I explain the evaluation setup on how we tested our system. So as a test bit of queries, we looked at existing knowledge graphs, um, such as Wikidata and Crunchbase. And here we wanted to construct a test pair of queries where multiple answers were correct. So we, can, we looked at five different categories of prominent entities here, and we chose prominence because um, here we wanted to test how quickly our system can retrieve massive amounts of sentences and text from the user. The first category we had were famous Olympians, and we tried to generate tables for the events in which they participated in. So the location of the event and the date of the event. These were the findings. The next category here we had was marriage. So we had famous entities, and we looked at the different people they were married to and for what duration, the date, uh, the time interval for which they were married. And the next category we had were footballers. So famous footballers and for what clubs and teams they played for and for what duration. The fourth category we had were CEOs of famous companies. So we had a list of companies and we wanted to generate a table where we wanted to identify different CEOs for this company and for what duration they were in power of that company. And finally, we had acquisitions. So we wanted to list all the acquisitions that were made by a given company on what date and for what uh, amount of money. As an example, consider this uh, in the category of uh, acquisitions uh, as a query in our test bill. So this basically tries to generate the table for all the acquisitions made by Google, right? And the surface forms, uh, the first surface, list of surface forms here correspond to Google, and then you have paraphrases for the predicate acquisition, and then the bindings for the, uh, the organization, date, and money. We tested our approach on three large news archives. First uh, archive we had was the New York Times annotated corpora, which is around 2 million documents. 
We then looked at the fifth edition of English Geek Award, which is around 10 million documents. And then we looked at the GDEV News Archive, which is a collection of very important events from multiple news sources. And this is the largest in our setup, which is around 14 million documents. And, for, and we processed each of these document collections for part of speech, named entities, temporal expressions, and numerical values using Stanford or NLP toolkit. And as I described, we created a county indexing infrastructure, so all the inverted indexes and the dictionary and the direct index and the index sizes here are listed in gigabytes. And as you can see, some of these sizes could be really large. And as you will read in our paper, it's not necessary that we utilize all the indexes for query processing. So we can just have a subset of the indexes to actually retrieve the sentences in support of the query. But to make our system as fast as possible, we keep the entire suite of indexes in our setup. The evaluation measures that we are after are precision and recall. So what does precision mean here? So how many rows from the count to the table? Um, so precision means here how many rows in the generated table are actually correct with respect to the ground truth we have. And in recall, we're trying to see how many rows in the ground truth are actually found in the generated table uh, by Jigsaw. And the uh, correctness of the row, the row in the system generated table is measured by attribute by similarity between the, from the row in the system generated table and the ground truth table. So currently, there exists no work that can actually take a user-defined schema, generate a table from unstructured text. Right? So in order to test our system, we made alternative design choices within our framework. So as the first baseline, we had a very simple system, which tried to perform uh, linking of rows using simple surface-level similarity and redundancy. For local null resolution technique, it utilized scoping. And for ranking and performing flattening of the link rows, it also utilized frequency. As a more advanced baseline, we performed linking of the raw rows using surface and contextual similarity for text-based attributes and interval overlaps for temporal and numerical attributes. And it performed the local null resolution technique using proximity method. And it again used frequency for flattening and ranking the rows in the final table. As our system, we have two variants, Jigsaw and Jigsaw++. Both utilize the semantic redundancy uh, model for text, uh, the semantic model for text and numbers for linking the raw rows, and utilize support and diversity for ranking the rows in the final table. Jigsaw performs local null resolution technique using the semantic redundancy method. With Jigsaw++, plus plus, we wanted to test how well the proximity method works as a co-reference resolution technique, and we utilize that for resolving the null values for uh, entity-centric queries such as CEO, footballers, and marriages, and the semantic redundancy method for acquisitions and alumnus. And so these are the results, uh, the precision results. And as you can see, our system wins by quite a margin, and more so for the largest document collection we have in our setup, which is GDEV. When we look at recall, it performs at par with the baselines, and if we try to combine both the precision and recall into the harmonic mean and look at the F1 score over all the document collection, we see that our system wins by quite a large margin. And this can be attributed to two key reasons. The first is that leveraging the semantics for text and numbers helps us perform the deduplication or linking of the raw rows quite well, as opposed to the baselines which only look at surface and contextual level similarity. And also utilizing the semantic models for performing local null resolution technique is also very helpful in estimating the null values. And next I present the runtime. So from the time the user presents the query, retrieving the sentences, text regions, and generating the final table that is presented to the user. And we see here that our system jigs actually takes more time as compared to the baselines. And this is mainly because of the fact that our system utilizes the skip round dictionaries to compute the global level uh, similarity uh, for text regions. So this requires additional lookups and for the script ground dictionaries. Whereas the baselines only utilize the edit distance space measure and the contextual level similarity, which are essentially in-memory operations. So this, what goes on to show that is if you want to generate a very rough table very quickly, you can do that within our framework. But if you want to spend a few more seconds, you can also get a highly polished or high quality table um, using the additional similarities. But all of this can be done in a matter of seconds. So in summary, what I presented today was Jigsaw, an end-to-end query-driven system that generates structured tables from unstructured text documents. 
and to generate these high quality tables, I describe the link and analysis operator. In our evaluation setup, I show that we can actually do this within a matter of seconds over millions of documents. Thank you very much.